dear viewers on KTV2, we welcome you to our weekly medical educational program, Medical Advice. As you all know, our weekly topics are chosen specially for you and your family. So we'll take a break and we'll get back with our program, Medical Advice. Welcome back our viewer with our program Medical Advice. Our guest for the week is Dr. Thamir al isa specialist in endocrinology and diabetes. Welcome with us Dr. Thamir. Thank you for having me. So Dr. Thamir, can you please explain for us what's diabetes as a disease? Okay, so uh, diabetes is, a, is a, a more of a syndrome rather than a disease itself. Uh, it's composed of different types and each type has a different uh, a pathophysiology, how is it formed, was it caused from, and uh, what kind of symptoms and, and features and medical management uh, also uh, slightly change between them. So diabetes is, is, um, is a general term for elevated levels of, uh, of sugars in the bloodstream. And, and, uh, and in, a con in a condition or in a situation that will make that high level of glucose in the blood uh, affect several organs and several dysfunction at several areas in the body. So, um, uh, for example, it might affect the function of the blood vessels, which are the most important part of the heart that, uh, of the body that actually that high glucose could affect. And it will cause uh, um, a tightening and, and uh, enlargement of, uh, or thickening of those blood vessels. So it will decrease the blood flow to them. Um, and in other situation, it could affect other uh, or solid organs like the, uh, the kidney, the, the, um, the eyes or the brain and other situation. And it's all related because of the high uh, glucose values. Dr. Thamer, can, we, can you please tell us about the type 1 and type 2 and what's the difference between these two types of diabetes? What you mentioned is there's the main important types of diabetes, which is type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. Uh, type 1 diabetes is the, um, is the diabetes that is caused because of inability of the pancreas to produce the hormone that we call insulin. Now, insulin is a very important hormone to regulate the level of glucose in the bloodstream. It's the one that actually manages uh, the, to lower the level of glucose, especially after eating, and it doesn't allow it to raise to a dangerous and, and, um, and, and the levels that would affect the, the organs of the body. So in type one, there is a problem with the production of the insulin from its own location in the pancreas, from what we call the beta cells. Uh, that dysfunction is mainly caused because of uh, inflammation of the pancreas by an unknown mechanism that we know that is coming from the immune system, but is not really clear until now is why this, um, uh, th this alteration in the immune system happened and why it's affecting uh, the pancreas and, and producing uh, 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 this effect on the pancreas and not enabling uh, the pancreas to produce insulin. Type 2 diabetes is uh, slightly different. Uh, the problem is that it's not of the ability to produce the insulin. Uh, it's actually, the insulin is being produced in even more than, uh, than enough. But the problem is that the insulin that is formed is not active insulin, meaning that the body it produces um, against the insulin some certain mechanisms that prevent its action at a normal, uh, a normal level, a normal pace. So the insulin is trying to help the body uh, get rid of the glucose, uh, but the, uh, the body is working against that. Uh, so in type 1 uh, specifically, there's a problem in the production of insulin. In type 2, there is a, uh, a problem in the action of the insulin. Uh, plus those two types, there's other 
of less common types. Uh, one of them is what we call gestational diabetes, which is diabetes that affect the pregnant woman, which is only a transient during pregnancy. And there is the rare forms of diabetes, uh, uh, what we call uh, genetic diabetes. So like uh, very newborn babies are born uh, with diabetes or diabetes that could affect um, some sort of uh, a different group of ages which uh, the, 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 the cause of it could be very congenital between, uh, between families and, and generations. Dr. Samuel, can we know the type 1 diabetes? It's more common at what age group? Uh, t uh, type 2 diabetes is actually much more common than type 1 diabetes. Uh, so in total diabetes, uh, type 1 could, uh, could be 20 to 30 percent of all cases of diabetes, where 70 percent of all diabetes cases that we see worldwide are type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is usually um, happens in young ages. Uh, it could happen as early as in birth, but usually uh, within the five uh, first uh, years of life or even the first 10 years of life. Uh, so it usually affects young, uh, young kids or very uh, early in adulthood um, and in teenager groups. And it's usually uh, uh, the, uh, the body shape of those uh, children and, 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 um, and, and kids are usually they're very thin, they could be very fit, and they suddenly develop those symptoms of elevated uh, high glucose and diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Dr. Tamil, can we know what's the theory behind type 1 diabetes? Well, we mentioned a little bit about it, is that there is a kind of inflammation, there's a kind of mechanism, uh, an inflammation of the pancreas itself, which is the source of produ producing the insulin. Uh, th this mechanism makes the pancreas ineffective and makes the, uh, the cells that produce the insulin are unable to produce it anymore. Now, uh, we're trying to, or the scientists worldwide, they're trying to identify what could be the cause of this uh, a problem affecting the pancreas. They, they came in agreement that, that there is the, uh, the source of this problem is the immune system, which is um, we have it to, f to fight all the kind of infections and, uh, that, that have, could happen to us. But in certain con uh, patients, uh, this immune system uh, would affect uh, its own, pro its own uh, body uh, organs or own body parts. So, so we'll start uh, producing some what we call antibodies to fight against the pancreas and those beta cells and even the insulin itself to make it ineffective and unable to produce it. Dr. Shamir, can you tell us more about the group of treatment available for diabetes? Uh, well, I if you want to talk about all diabetes in terms of a treatment, uh, then there is uh, different groups of, of a treatment. Uh, for, uh, for type 1 diabetes, there is only one kind of treatment available, which is insulin. Now, insulin, uh, uh, as we said, is the actually in the naturally producing hormone from the pancreas to regulate the, uh, the glucose levels in the blood. Uh, so uh, what, what's been made is like an, an, um, an artificial insulin, uh, which, is, um, um, which is exactly the one that is made by the uh, by the humans and and we were able to uh, manufacture this kind of insulin and make it as a drug so they can uh, they can be used uh, unfortunately so far the insulin that we have is only injectables uh, there are new version of insulin which we can see in, in a picture in a few minutes uh, about a, a different kind of insulin which is inhaled insulin but the ones that we majority uh, our people are using are injectable insulin I can show you some samples here of the insulin we have uh, this is one uh, one type of, uh, of, um, of insulin that, uh, that comes in pens and uh, this pen is filled with the, with the fluid that's actually the insulin and attached to the end with, with a needle that actually we can use it to inject the insulin. Now this, um, this, uh, this pen with the insulin inside it is used several times a day for type 1 diabetes to treat their diabetes. Um, in, in, in different group of patients in different kind of diabetes, like for type 2 diabetes, this insulin could be also helpful in, in, um, and to use to, to treat those patients. And it could be not necessarily to use it several times a day. It could be used once or twice a day, depending on the case. For type 2 diabetes, before the use of insulin, there are other ways of treatment also. For type 2 diabetes, that is always important uh, to talk about lifestyle changes. Because in type 2 diabetes, we know the most important thing, uh, important factor in causing diabetes is actually obesity, lack of exercise, and the diet that is high in carbohydrates and calories. So uh, regulating those three is very important as first uh, part of the treatment of diabetes. Um, and, and, and if that doesn't work or uh, the patient needs extra help beside this lifestyle, then we have what we call oral therapy, 
or drugs, medication, oral medication, that we can use to help uh, fight or treat diabetes. Uh, I brought some of them here so we can take a look. The one that very commonly used is, um, is called metformin. Uh, That's the chemical name, glucophage. We're not making any kind of... Um, uh, uh, publicity for any kind of uh, products, but we're saying this is one of the most common drugs that's used in the Ministry of Health called glucophage. Uh, so this is the usually the initial drug that we use to treat diabetes with. Now, if the patient needs extra help or this drug by itself is not very effective, then there is different other classes of tra diabetes treatment we can use. One other class of diabetes treatment, uh, what we call the sulfonylureas. And there are two drugs that are very common in the, in the Ministry of Health that we use. One of them is called dimacron, the other one is called amaryl. Both of them from the same group of what we call sulfonylureas. Uh, those group of, uh, of drugs, what actually they can do is make the, the pancreas produce much more insulin. Uh, the previous one that I showed, which is a glucophage, uh, makes the body more susceptible to insulin, makes the insulin action more easier to happen within the body, and also helps the liver to produce less glucose uh, because that's what naturally the liver does. This is a, so this is what we showed here, another type of uh, or class of, uh, of medication. Then there is a third uh, class of medication that we can use to treat diabetes, and this is specifically all the oral treatments that we're talking about are mainly for type 2 diabetes. Uh, this one in particular is uh, from a newer version of classes that have uh, been in the market for the last five years almost. Um, um, the uh, the uh, able to uh, also uh, stimulate the pancreas to produce insulin, but in, in a different kind of way when there is mainly that is diet or food in, within the GI tract or the, the stomach specifically. Um, this is called cytagliptin. The brand name is Genuvia. Um, the, this is a family uh, of, uh, of a drug that's, uh, there's uh, different brands of them, and uh, a lot of them are using Kuwait and worldwide to treat the diabetes. Now, beside those, there's, uh, there's a at least two to three other classes uh, that we're not able to bring, and uh, one of them actually is a brand new in the market. Uh, we haven't have it still yet in Kuwait, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's able to um, uh, expel the extra amount of glucose that runs in the blood uh, through the urine uh, into the kidney and through the, throughout the urine. Uh, and this is a kind of a different way of how to regulate the glucose is by uh, disposing much of it out uh, from the urinary system. So this is one another way of, uh, uh, of treating. Now, in the oral treatments that we mentioned, we can join several of them. We can join two tablets, three tablets all together to try and to fight this, uh, uh, this diabetes, the type 2 diabetes plus the lifestyle what we mentioned. Now, a lot of those uh, the patients uh, would not uh, be successful treatment considered. So we have to add injectable drugs, what we call. So the injectable drugs, as we said in the pen, uh, it's insulin, and there is another injectable drug that is actually not an insulin, but it's, a, but it's also a different class of a drug uh, uh, that we call GLB-1 agonists, which also stimulate the pancreas to produce more insulin to fight the resistant uh, against insulin that's in the body at that point. So um, a lot of those medication can be joined together um, as a combination, what we call as a combination therapy. But going back to uh, type 1 diabetes is, is mainly the insulin. Now, there is another way of treating uh, type 1 diabetes with insulin. I would like to show it to the viewers is what we call the uh, insulin pump. Now, and it's in the screen, we can see it. Insulin pump is actually a way of delivering insulin to the body. Uh, through a pump, which is a small device, very smart device, uh, that uh, at the end of the, uh, if you can see there's a, a small tube in the picture, at the end of the small tube, uh, it's actually attached to a small plastic needle that's implanted uh, in, inside, um, under the skin, and the patient does that himself. And the machine um, has um, um, uh, the insulin with it, inside it, and it, uh, and it delivers or pumps insulin uh, uh, 24 hours. For uh, as long as there is insulin in the pump, it just keeps pumping uh, insulin throughout the body. So, it, uh, so uh, the patient would not need, uh, would not uh, need to use the insulin injectables, uh, but he could also use uh, the pump to, tr to, uh, uh, to shift the insulin all uh, within the, the body. And uh, this is uh, another picture which showed, uh, which can show the, uh, what would, could be the numbers in those, uh, in those pumps. It gives, can, can give a trend how much insulin is given. And this is uh, uh, just to show you how basically uh, it's attached to the skin 
and uh, the palm transmits the, uh, the insulin through the uh, small pipe uh, under the skin uh, to the patient. So this is one way uh, of, of treating uh, the, um, uh, diabetes, especially the ones who depend on insulin. Now, I just mentioned to you a little bit of, uh, ago about the uh, inhaled insulin. So this is a picture of a brand new um, uh, way of treating diabetes, uh, which has think it been in the market maybe less than a year ago. It's actually an inhaled insulin, uh, where it comes as almost like a, um, um, a, a material which could be inhaled through a small device. Now, this kind of insulin substitutes the um, what we call short-acting insulin, which is the insulin that is used before meals. So we can use this before meals, but we uh, patients with type 1 diabetes might need another type of insulin to regulate their uh, their glucose throughout the day on a 24-hour period. Dr. Tamer, is this yep. available in Kuwait? This one, unfortunately, not yet. Okay. Uh, it's a brand new, um, um, probably in the market for, as I said, six months or maybe 12, uh, 12 months, and it hasn't been in Kuwait yet. Okay. So our dear viewers, we'll take a break and we'll get back to you soon. Hi, welcome to the SMAN Diabetes Institute. I'm Dennis Reyes Taliping. I'm one of the fitness instructors here in the Fitness and Rehabilitation Center. So today, I'm gonna tell you all about what we have and what we cater here in the Fitness and Rehabilitation Center. The Fitness and Rehabilitation Center Institute, we provide an array of services for diabetic and non-diabetic patients. The fitness and the Heaven Center, we offer different kinds of services to give you a quality exercise program. Firstly, a client or a patient will be seen by a doctor for a medical clearance by appointment. And after that, a patient will undergo some medical tests, like the cardiopulmonary exercise test. This is the stress test, which is a tool that provides an objective measurement of work capacity of body and its limitation by assessing the respiratory, cardiac, and metabolic system. And also, a body composition which will follow to measure the body fat percentage, mineral, and water weight. And after this, a prescribed exercise will be given based on the cardiopulmonary exercise test and other tests that perform an individual and individual's exercise prescription is tailored to your needs and physical condition. This exercise and some of the tests will be done by our exercise specialist here in FRC. In addition to this, a nutritionist will be included for each member program. So the exercise for each patient member will be assisted and guided by a professional fitness instructor from group exercise, cardiopulmonary exercise, strength training exercise, and hydrotherapy exercise. So the fitness and the habitat center is open six days a week from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. Thank you. We here in a fitness and rehabilitation center, we encourage not only diabetic patients but also non-diabetic patients to come here and exercise with us to promote our healthy lifestyle in our daily living here in Kuwait. Thank you very much.
Hello, uh, I'm here at the Diabetic Center exercising because I've had many health problems. I had the liver transplant 32 years ago and many more operations. So this keeps me in fit, it keeps me fit and uh, we have to have self-discipline so that we can exercise and get up every morning and be willing to go. It takes a lot of self-discipline just to get up in the morning and say, I'm going to go to exercise. But it has many health benefits, working out on the machines and uh, doing upper body exercise, lower body exercise, and uh, on the bicycle, and we do many machines and it is very helpful and I find I have benefited from these exercises. I encourage people to come and work out because you have each person that comes as a patient, they have a private instructor and this is very helpful. It helps you, they encourage you and it is very beneficial to you and you will find many benefits. You don't necessarily have to be a diabetic. If you come and be interviewed by the doctor and you've had many health problems, then he will help you and put you a program so that the instructors can help you. Welcome back our dear viewers with our program Medical Advice. We would like to continue our question with Dr. Tamer. So we would like to know that type 2 diabetes is the major type in adult. What are the major causes of the disease? Uh, we just uh, touched base on it just brief, uh, a few minutes ago. We said that the major contributors for type 2 diabetes are three main things, uh, or actually four. I could add one more. Uh, one of them is, uh, is uh, uh, decreased the activity level, and that's very crucial in producing um, high resistance to insulin, which we said is the main important part of why uh, type 2 diabetes happens, is that resistance to insulin. So uh, less activity. Uh, combined with that is increase in body weight, especially beyond the BMI of, uh, or the body mass index of 25, which indicates that the patient or the person is going into the overweight uh, um, uh, category. Um, and the third uh, thing is the, the diet that is rich in carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are a type of nutrients, uh, which is uh, it's a big group of nutrients, actually. Within this group of nutrients, uh, we have uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the breads, all the kind of uh, bran or bran, or even um, uh, non-whole non wheat bran is uh, considered also carbohydrates. Uh, so like bread, toast, uh, rice, uh, potatoes, uh, pastas, all these are considered as carbohydrates. And then we have also the uh, refined sugars, or even the sugary stuff. Uh, like sugary drinks, uh, sugary meals, um, uh, sweets in general, all these are big range of what we call carbohydrates. So a diet rich in carbohydrates also will, uh, might induce this, uh, these changes in the body to produce the insulin resistance and then type 2 diabetes. And we cannot forget the, uh, the important role of genetics. Uh, well, scientists discovered that type 2 diabetes also could happen because of bad genes. Mm -hmm. And those genes could be inherited from uh, a first degree relative or a far even that, like grandparents or great grandparents could transmit those, uh, those bad genes. But those bad genes are usually not enough to cause diabetes unless those bad genes are joined with bad or poor lifestyle um, uh, attitudes. Uh, so someone carries the genes of uh, diabetes because his parents, his grandfathers had diabetes, uh, and he joins it with a uh, lower level of activity, weight gain, and, and poor, appetite, uh, poor diet. Yeah, definitely his, his uh, prospect or his future is, is very high risk in developing type 2 diabetes. 
Dr. Shamir, can you tell us what's the usually the most common symptoms that the family start noticing before labeling a patient as diabetes? Um, the, the family could notice that or the, even the person himself could notice that on himself. Mm -hmm. That depends on what the age group we're talking about. Uh, so little kids, um, mm -hmm. uh, the parents or the family members or caregivers could notice that the most important thing or this sensitive thing I would say uh, is that uh, he's always 30 thirsty and he always goes to the bathroom to, uh, to urinate. So this is a very sensitive uh, um, uh, way of identifying who, who could be um, um, a cat or, uh, someone who could be developing, uh, developing the diabetes. Also um, noticing in, in young kids that they are losing weight, uh, they're, uh, they're getting more weaker and tired and not as active as before. Uh, uh, and they, as I said, losing weight, their appetite might change. Um, uh, they could even eat much more but still lose more weight. Uh, because of a much breakdown in their muscles and their other and the and body fat, uh, that's also related to the incidence or the trigger, uh, the beginning symptoms of type one diabetes in, in young kids. And if we talk about type two diabetes now, uh, since we're talking at a different age group, which are adults, so they would notice that on themselves. So it's almost the same thing. Uh, people can, might come to the doctor or go to the lab to have some blood, their uh, glucose check because they had symptoms of uh, excessive urinating, uh, urination, uh, excessive thirst. Uh, they also, they could lose uh, body weight, uh, with especially uh, their, their appetite is, is actually good with that. Uh, they could also have uh, symptoms, a lot of symptoms of tiredness, headaches, uh, generalized weakness. Uh, so those are kind of the symptoms. Now there are symptoms, well, not are symptoms actually, there are signs uh, to kind of help the, a physician or a medical expert to identify someone who's at very high risk of developing diabetes. Uh, so a physician might see a patient who come in for a different problem, but on physical examination, he could pick up few signs which could tell that this patient might have a, a potency to develop type 2 diabetes. And I would like to show the viewers uh, one of those features. Um, a lot of people s suffer or complain about um, those kind of black marks on their necks, especially the back of the necks. And, and this is usually associated with someone who, who is overweight or obese. Now, this uh, uh, black uh, parts, we call them acanthosis, and those are uh, beginning or signs or features of insulin resistance, as we said, as the trigger of the type 2 diabetes. Uh, so, um, yeah, so this is, this is a feature that tells us that this patient is at risk of developing diabetes. This feature could happen at the neck, or also it could be uh, shown in the armpit uh, with uh, what we call also skin tags. So all these are features of insulin resistance that could tell us that this patient is at risk of developing diabetes. Dr. Tamir, you were saying about the genetic, like the patient uh, can get diabetes due to bad genetics. So can you tell us if there is any marker the patient can like check for markers to know if he's uh, going to be diabetes soon? Yeah. Um, for type 2 diabetes, it's, it's very complicated, uh, meaning um, there's a lot of genes involved. And we cannot really isolate one gene to give us the highest possibility risk of developing diabetes, uh, which is type 2 diabetes. Plus, as we said, uh, genetics uh, play an important part, but the, the lifestyle it plays even much higher impo important uh, role. So uh, improving lifestyle could help someone uh, not to develop diabetes, even if he has a genetic inheritance. Now, for type 1 diabetes, yeah, there are several genes which could be identified on, uh, on a, an earlier test. Uh, and this is someone we recommend if the family have a very strong history of type 1 diabetes. Example, if the brothers and sisters of the new baby already have diabetes, uh, type 1, uh, then there is a big chance that this new, uh, new child could have also type 1 diabetes. And he could have uh, a screening test or a genetic test uh, applied uh, to identify if he's also one of those group of patients who could uh, high develop uh, diabetes in the future. So for type 1 diabetes, yes, and we usually do that for the patients, as I said, with a very high risk of developing diabetes. But for type 2, it's really hard to, uh, to predict based on genetics only. Okay, Dr. Tamer, what's the most important lab investigation to prove that the patient is diabetes? Well, we definitely depend on glucose value because it's a glucose disease. So glucose value is the one that tells us that this problem with the glucose management or glucose control. So uh, we depend on um, a glucose fasting test to tell us uh, uh, if the patient is developing diabetes or not. And uh, we also depend on a special type of tests. Some, uh, another test we call hemoglobin A1C 
which is uh, a type of a protein that runs in the blood but attached itself to molecules of glucose very tightly. So we know if those molecules of protein are attached to glucose at a very high level, that means there is a high sugar amount in the blood. So uh, a hemoglobin A1C of a value of 6.5% and higher is an indication that this patient has diabetes or diagnosed with diabetes. And the hemoglobin A1C test is a very easy test. It can be t done in any uh, polyclinic or any uh, uh, hospital or any private lab. Uh, and and, it, and the, uh, the result can come up with the next day or two days maximum. And it could tell us, uh, help us a lot in, in differentiating or if this patient is diabetic or not. Uh, and then there is also a test which is uh, mostly used for, um, for gestational diabetes, for, for diabetes who, in the pregnant women to see if they are developing diabetes during their pregnancy, where would they actually drink a sugary drink um, and then test their sugars before it, one hour, one hour two hours after uh, the drinking sugar to come up with a certain values to say if those values are indication for being diabetes or not. So uh, f for tests, yeah, all of them are glucose testing, but they are different ones um, and, uh, and they're available in, in all the, uh, the, uh, the places of the Ministry of Health and even the private sector. Okay, so our dear viewer, we'll take a break and we'll get back to you soon. Hi everyone, my name is Basit Dawaz. I am a specialized pharmacist working with the Dasman Diabetes Institute. Today we are standing at the Dasman Diabetes Institute Pharmacy premises and I'm um, particularly interested to talk to you about the role of pharmacists in diabetes care and management. In recent years, pharmacists have been standing a very important role in diabetes care and management it's through effective counseling and um, medication education to patients where they can actually take their medication in the right way, in the right time, for um, a better management of their blood glucose levels. When a patient gets um, diagnosed with, with, with diabetes, um, especially if they are type 2 diabetes, um, their physicians would usually prescribe them with a three months long um, of uh, lifestyle changes, along with few medications that they can actually take and help them to control their blood glucose. We'll be starting with the first medication that the physician would actually prescribe for a diabetic. It's called Glucophage as a brand name. <clears throat> Generically, it's metformin, and it comes in several strengths, starting with the 500 milligrams, going up to 1,000 milligrams. Um, a patient can take um, up to 2,750 milligrams, sorry, of this medication. Um, what this medication actually does, um, it, it acts in a two pathway um, direction in the body. Uh, it will actually regulate the blood glucose levels in a diabetic body um, through the, the, the liver mechanism and also decreasing the insulin resistance, which is usually associated with type 2 diabetes patients. This medication is usually prescribed um, along with a lifestyle um, change for three months. And if that doesn't work, usually the prescriber can um, prescribe another medication on top of these medications to actually work on the pancreas itself. One of those medications are called diamicron um, with the, uh, a generic name of glectoside. It comes as a 60 milligrams um, modified release medication. What it actually does, it goes to the pancreas of, of a diabetic patient and it will actually um, enhance the secretion mechanism of the pancreas um, in a trial to uh, increase their insulin secretion and therefore having more insulin in their bloodstream will actually open the doors for the glucose to enter into the cell and um, provide uh, the benefits out of it. Other medications um, similar to diamicron would be Dawonil, five milligrams, and also Amaryl, three milligrams, which actually comes into many strengths as well, two milligrams, three milligrams, and four milligrams. These class of medications are generally called the secretagogues. Um, 
uh, applying their action on the pancreas and secreting the, um, enough insulin to uh, get rid of, of the glucose or extra glucose on the bloodstream into the cells. After a while, if the, ba if the patient is not responding to these um, oral medications, the prescriber might actually um, move on and prescribe the patient with, with insulin injections, which are actually a cornerstone in diabetes care and management in reducing blood glucose levels. Now, insulin comes into many types. Okay, we'll start with this one first. It's called um, Novorapid. Um, which is one of the types of insulin. It's a rapid acting insulin that works, that, that actually takes about 10 to 15 minutes to work and that's why it's usually advised for the patient to inject themselves pre-meal, I mean 15 to 10, 10 to 15 minutes pre-meal, giving a chance for the medication to work while they're eating. <coughs> the second kind of insulin would be Lantus, is insulin glargine um, and it works as a long-acting insulin it takes about 24 min 24 hours uh, I mean it, it, it can actually work for 24 hours along the day um, giving a steady uh, insulin levels into in the in the diabetic body making sure that blood glucose is regulated all through the day the third kind of insulin is the novo mix and with the name of mix so it has a mixture of of insulins it's usually a long acting insulin along with a short acting or rapid acting, act, acting insulin um, giving a chance for people uh, who has uh, regular uh, nutritional needs throughout the day um, to have both insulins um, available in the body at the same time um, and hopefully they can get into the point where they can actually control their blood glucose levels better. Welcome back, our dear viewer, with our program Medical Advice. Now, Dr. Tamer, we would like to ask you, usually a pre-diabetic patient, what do you advise them and how, what's the role of the diabetes, diabetologist and yeah. the dietitian in this part? So pre-diabetes is a category of people who are uh, very prone to developing diabetes. They are not normal, but they are not also not diabetic. So they are in between group. And those are patients who have a slight rise in their glucose values, but not to the level of developing diabetes yet. We tell them that you have to improve your lifestyle. Otherwise, your chance of developing diabetes in the next 10 years is about 50%. You need to lose weight, about five to 10% of your body weight. You need to reduce your carbohydrates uh, that you take uh, for not more than 30% of your uh, plates. Uh, that you eat every day and you need to start exercising and working out for about 45 minutes uh, five days a week. Okay, Dr. Taman, we would like to know the diabetologist plan usually for the first line of treatment and the second line of treatment in diabetes. So first line of treatment is always lifestyle, as we mentioned. So the first important, the three things which we said, lowering carbohydrates, starting uh, exercise for about 45 minutes, five days a week, and trying to lose weight for about five to 10% of the body weight. Second line after that comes medications. And we already reviewed some of those medications, which include, as we said, the, uh, the glucophage would be a first choice usually uh, to start start with, then we showed the other uh, group which is sulfonylurea, we said there's the uh, Damacron and Amaryl, there's two groups we can use, uh, plus the Genuvia which is the third one, and then they have after that the injectable uh, uh, type of medications, and we can, uh, and those injectable medications are either um, insulin or non-insulin, uh, and we can use them according to uh, the, the uh, how effective the treatment was before, and how much is needed uh, much more to improve, uh, to reach the, uh, the proper level of, of glucose control. Dr. Tamer, you mentioned exercise. Can you tell us what type of exercise and for how long and when the patient should do this exercise? Walking is very efficient exercise and that's all much, uh, this is uh, what we all want from our patients to do. Uh, it's the easiest thing, it's the most uh, efficient thing and, and it can be applied at any time and anywhere. So walking is very good for about 45 minutes, five days a week. If someone wants to add more than walking, running, climbing steps, 
uh, swimming, uh, that's all good, uh, but all of them should be within uh, the 45 minutes of activity level uh, that, that matches the walking and the amount of calories and, and that they can actually burn within that period of time. So is it in the morning or late evening? Uh, no, uh, the, a, lot of, a lot of theories, a lot of uh, studies they were trying to evaluate. Uh, I don't think there is anything conclusive. And I think it it's depends on the patient and where he thinks it's, uh, it's more suitable for him. Uh, Dr. Tamer, which type of food do you advise the patient to avoid? Um, I, I really try them to avoid anything. I, I always tell them to improve their uh, diet uh, uh, regimen as much as possible. I try uh, to tell them you have to uh, reduce the amount of sugary um, uh, food items that you use, uh, the amount of carbohydrates uh, to the uh, quarter or third at most of your plate, uh, maybe one or two uh, portions of sweets a day. Uh, you might probably want to avoid completely juices because they are not really an efficient uh, a way of nutrition, uh, especially for diabetics. and. Uh, and other than that, uh, exercise and walking is the most important thing, even if your diet was not optimal. Okay. So, our dear viewer, we would like to take a break. And during this break, you're going to see a reportage with the dietitian. Hello, dear viewers. Uh, my name is uh, Ali Al Saraf. I'm a clinical dietitian at uh, Mubarak Al Kabir Hospital. Uh, today, I would like to speak with you about uh, the healthy eating, emphasizing the three main points that I would like you to. Uh, to follow uh, so that you have a better control over your diabetes. Uh, the first point and focus number one is to focus on whole grains. Uh, by whole grains we mean that you need to focus on foods that are actually made of the whole grain itself. So examples are brown bread, brown toast, brown rice and brown macaroni. Uh, try to implement more of these grains into your diet. Uh, because most of uh, health institutions recommend that actually even if you don't have diabetes that you make half of your grains in each day to be out of whole grains. So this is focus number one. Focus number two is to focus on whole food. So uh, instead of drinking juices uh, like uh, even uh, fruit, ju fruit packets or fresh fruit juice, it needs to be even if it was fresh meaning that uh, it's fresh, it's not uh, healthy that to consume lots of it. It can even uh, harm your diabetes, uh, the blood sugar speci specifically. So focus on whole fruits by consuming whole apples, whole uh, oranges, any other uh, types that you, uh, that you like. So because it will have more benefits and it will actually contain less sugar. Uh, so this is our second focus. Our third focus is to make half of your plate to contain vegetables. So not just have the machboos with uh, just the chicken or meat on top, rather no, have uh, in your plate more veggies and less of the grains, uh, less rice or pasta or macaroni, and focus more on the vegetables. And the vegetables have to be green or colorful vegetables, not emphasizing on potatoes or uh, starchy vegetables, no, focus on fresh vegetables with light dressings like lemon juice, uh, some uh, olive oil and uh, so that we have a healthy vegetables, not vegetables that are, can harm us in other way. Uh, so these are the three main focuses and uh, don't forget to have a good intake of water. So just during my duty today, I finished almost half a liter. So try to have the water beside you, whether you are at work, at home, or even if you are out for uh, some leisure times or finishing some uh, uh, work that you need to do outside, make sure that you have a bottle of water with you. It will uh, remind you, most of us tend to forget to drink water. We don't, for, uh, we don't drink water until we realize that we are thirsty. So it's important that we have it around us because uh, it will remind us to have a good intake of water. And one uh, tip that I would like to share with you is uh, uh, focusing on label reading. Since we are talking about uh, diabetes today and how to control our blood sugar, uh, our, our uh, sugar intake, so it's important to read the food label. Uh, I uh, intended to bring this product you will find many products, especially the ones who are uh, 
diagnosed with diabetes will try to buy some products that are sugar free, labeled sugar free or no added sugar because they will think that it will have no sugar in it. But let me tell you, uh, by law they are allowed to write that if they are within the specific guidelines and limits but at the same time you have the right to check the food label. So this is important to do. So when you uh, find the food label just try to check the serving size first. So here it says nutrition facts for one sacket. So this is for the full sacket itself. So then we go to total carbohydrates. So here it's showing as seven grams per packet. Usually we tend to uh, recommend that if it's below five grams, you can sort of neglect that amount and will not consider it. But since, or uh, if it's at any time, if it's five and above, you have to consider the amount. It will have to be within your specific uh, carbohydrate amount that you have to stick to per day. So in this case, it's labeled sugar-free, but it has seven grams of carbohydrate, which is, as I said, is a significant amount. So next time you go to the grocery store, make sure that if you want to grab a sugar-free product, to read the food label from the back. Okay, this will make sure that uh, you know how much carbohydrate and so that you are not tricked. Okay, so you can be smart about the food choices that you go with at the supermarket. So, as I said, focus on the three main points. Uh, good intake of whole grains, good intake of whole fruits. Make half of your plate uh, contains uh, vegetables and don't forget your water. Thank you. Welcome back our viewers with our program Medical Advice. We would like to ask you Dr. Tamer about the stem cell. A lot of research is being conducted in this, so can you advise us on this? Yeah, so uh, stem cells are, are, are uh, the part of a way of, of, of future treatment, I would say. And it's been in the talk of the social media and between a lot of people, uh, is that how does it work and if it's effective for type 1 diabetes. So stem cells are actually cells which are uh, primitive in the body. Uh, and, we and we can actually manipulate the, the, the signals that go to the stem cells and make them uh, any kind of cells within the body. So we use them as a to replace uh, the damaged cells in the pancreas that produce the insulin, which we call the beta cells. So we can make those stem cells as beta cells to produce insulin and then treat the type 1 diabetes specifically uh, because those are the ones that actually have the problem with their beta cells and their uh, insulin ability to be produced. So um, what's going on right now in terms of the stem cell research are actually two things. Either it's completely fraud and it's completely false and they're just joking about people and stealing their money, or the other thing is just purely experimental. And um, so what I tell people is that if you want to go to a place where they do stem cell therapy for your diabetes, you need to make sure to differentiate if this is experimental or they're completely stealing your money or and it's completely false. So if this is experimental, then you need to sign papers and need to understand it. They need to show you that this, what they're doing is exp actually experiment. You need to approve yourself that you're going into an experiment. Otherwise, don't do it. Uh, and if that's not the case, then um, uh, stem cell therapy as a treatment is not actually a licensed treatment anywhere in the, in the, uh, in the world. So I don't recommend people to go uh, for it unless they are accepting to go into a research center where they, uh, b where the experiment are applied to them to see what the future could happen. Stem cells by itself is a very futuristic treatment. Uh, ho we very hopefully uh, uh, want them to, to, s to be succeeding and successful in treating type 1 diabetes. The future is very bright. Uh, there are new um, theories behind how to uh, manage this kind of um, uh, way of treatment uh, there and um, uh, we predict that in the near future we can see a very promising results of this kind of therapy but right now it's all experimental. Dr. Tamer, is it done once or you have to repeat doing this? Well, it's, it's very uh, early to say that. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll see what the results come out uh, when we when start using the stem cells uh, uh, on, on those patients. Now, there is other types of cells that we can implant to patients. One of them is what we call islet cell transplant. And islet cell transplant are, w are from donors. We take a pancreas from a donor. We uh, isolate only the beta cells that produce, or, or the, we call them also the islet cells that produce the insulin, and we take those. We take the, uh, these um, cells 
and we introduce them into the type 1 diabetic so they can produce a new insulin uh, to those patients. So, and I have a picture here, you can see it, which actually um, shows us that uh, the type 1 diabetes uh, it could be um, could be seen and uh, could be treated with this uh, islet cell itself. And, uh, and, and those um, uh, islet cells uh, could uh, live for a few years, but unfortunately, uh, a, a new transfusion of those islet cells should be introduced. Uh, but for stem cells, it's still very early to decide uh, if this is going to last for many years or a very short while. So, Dr. Tamer, any last advice you would like to give our viewers? Uh, I would really recommend uh, uh, on um, uh, early screening for type 2 diabetes. Uh, anyone who is at risk of developing diabetes uh, should not wait until he is diabetic. They should go and test their sugars, uh, uh, their control and their glucose control and glucose levels very early. So, some, anyone who has a uh, family history uh, and first degree relatives who have diabetes, uh, he's overweight, he's a smoker, he has high blood pressure, has high cholesterol, he's obese, he's less very uh, um, low in activity level, they should be tested uh, almost every year to see if they're diabetic or not. Okay, we would like to thank you so much, Dr. Thamer, for sharing with us this knowledge. And we hope that our viewer had made all the benefits hearing all these advices. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you so much for having You're me. You're most you. welcome. So our dear viewer, hope to see you next week with our new episode of Medical Advice and wish you a very good night. Thank you. <laughs>